So um, I, I just finished the book over the weekend. Um, and I really appreciated all the stories, right? Like you, you have been, you know, a firsthand participant and talked to uh, lots of other people who were about like the evolution of this from, you know, kind of a crazy idea that uh, you know a handful of small teams worked on, and and uh, and so I really loved all the stories and just getting to know the people, you know, someone you might hear about in the news, and yeah. and I just loved the way he's told the story. So I thought. Um, since you know this is we're at Google, this is a book about the driverless car. Maybe a fun story to jump into would be to tell everybody a little about your first ride in a chauffeur car. Yeah, I'm happy to do that, and thanks everybody for coming today. It's a real pleasure. It's a pleasure to be part of your team. Actually, um, I was um, at General Motors until 2009. Um, we had competed in the DARPA Urban Challenge in 2007. You know, that was a race of robotic cars, and the first prize was $2 million, and GM was starting to hit the wall at that time, so I figured we needed the money. We better go out and win this race. <laughs> but the, we sponsored uh, Carnegie Mellon's team, and, and Chris Ermson, um, who subsequently led this program uh, for Google self-driving cars, um, reached out to me after I left GM. They were looking for a, a gray beard auto executive that could, could help them out. So I came out in um, 2010. Uh, the deal was I'd come out and talk to them if I could ride in the car. And they had 13 Priuses. Um, and it was remarkable progress because at the Urban Challenge, we had a Chevy Tahoe sport utility vehicle that was just loaded with hardware. I mean, you could, you could barely squeeze one person into the vehicle. And by the time they were um, doing the testing in 2009 and 10, they had it in a Prius. Most of all the hardware was in the, the trunk of the Prius plus the sensors on the outside. So at that time you could ride on 101 in the vehicle um, and it's a, basically an expressway. So I drove the car out. I had a, a technician next to me in the passenger seat and I had an engineer in the back seat and I had a big red panic button on the console. So this is you know two, late 2010, early 2011. And they said, OK, just engage it like you would cruise control. I was in the middle lane of the freeway. And my hands are shaking over the steering wheel. My feet are shaking. I'm thinking, this is crazy. But you know, once I engaged it, within about a couple minutes, Jeremy, it started feeling natural. The, the car was intuitive, even at that point in time. A Volkswagen Beetle came up on my left and cut in front of me. And I realized the car I was in had already backed off and started to create a gap for that vehicle to get into. And you would never be able to do that as a driver. This technology is like eagle eye vision with eyes in the back of your head. Later on, a big semi truck came up on my right. And sure enough, my car was nudging over a bit. But what I found so fascinating was after the first 10 minutes, I was so relaxed, I wasn't even worried about whether traffic backed up in front of me. I never thought about jumping to the right lane or left lane to get in front of someone. It just took all the road rage and stress out of driving. <laughs> so I, I was sold. And that, that was a remarkable accomplishment and, and just a real testament to how, how good this team was that you had a Google self-driving cars. Yeah, it was it was really striking to hear the, the uh, there's a story you tell about, I think, riding in one of the early Carnegie Mellon yes, cars. Yeah, and yeah. Well, I um, because General Motors was the sponsor of the, of the Carnegie Mellon uh, boss, we call the boss the Chevy Tahoe. I thought it was important that I, being head of R&D, go out and put in an appearance and get to know the team. We had some of our engineers embedded with the team. And so I went out, and they had it out on a, their test track, which was a, a real old like steel plant that had been. They sort of just sort of grabbed it and started using it. I don't even know if they had permission to do it, but it was <laughs> rutted roads and everything. And they were showing me how the vehicle would operate autonomously. And I said, oh, I'd like a ride in it. And they kind of looked at me and smiled. And, they didn't say no, but I said, yeah, I really would like to ride in it. So they squeezed me in that one little area that you could fit into. Well, this vehicle wasn't designed for a human. This vehicle was designed to win a self-driving car race. So it accelerated very aggressively, stopped very aggressively, cornered very aggressively. And within about 30 seconds, I'm getting so car sick. <laughs> and they're all laughing about this because they really put one over on me. But that was an important point. Um, the Carnegie Mellon team felt that by being an aggressive driver, we were more like an X Games athlete in this competition. We knew Stanford was going to be more like a, 
a, a figure skater, and they were going to have a really smooth, nice, precise vehicle. But we knew enough about the race that we thought we could pick up six minutes by accelerating hard and braking hard, and, and we won the race by 20 minutes. So that was an, an important part of our car. Yeah, yeah. We, you mentioned uh, riding in the chauffeur car the first time. You, you pretty quickly were relaxed and not worried about things. And you sort of comment that they're actually, you know, they're, there are different strategies being pursued in the marketplace today about, you know, like how do how do we deploy this technology? How do we bring it to a mass audience? And one is kind of this driver assist version that, um, and and the other is more of a service. And you kind of observe that. Um, what did you say? I think that uh, the driver assist version says. You don't need to pay attention to the road, except that because it's an assistant, it also says you need to be pay att paying attention yes. at all times in order to take over. Yeah. And I wonder if you want to comment a well, little bit about yeah, that. I, um, you know, the Google self-driving car team, I think, made two really big decisions. They made a lot of great decisions, but early on, they made the decision that they wanted to create a car that didn't rely on what's called vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle or vehicle-to-infrastructure communication. So a lot of people in this field thought that if you get cars talking to each other, they could avoid each other. Mm. But I think the Google self-driving car team realized that you'd have to have all cars capable, and it would take forever to get to that point. They also believe, because of your background mapping, and because of their knowledge of the sensors, that they could actually do a standalone self-driving car. And, and, and that was critically important. They began to develop this technology that I experienced on the freeway, and they thought maybe they could do an initial product called the Highway Assist. And they did do a dog fooding uh, exercise with the, the local Mountain View Google employees, asked them to use the vehicle on weekends. They had to promise to pay attention to their driving, but they could take it to Lake Tahoe and stuff. Well, lo and behold, within the first few weeks, we realized that, that these people were totally distracted. One individual even fell asleep. And you would never have been able to re-engage them if something came up. Uh, and Nathaniel Fairfield on the team, he reached an important conclusion, I think, shared with all of us. He said, you know, if we always keep the driver in the loop, we're never going to be safer than the driver. 90% of the crashes are due to human error. So they concluded these driver assist, Jeremy, yeah. was not consistent with their goal, which was to eliminate car crashes altogether, and made the second really important decision that their commitment was to totally autonomous, where a person would never be asked to take over. Now, you can imagine what a challenge that is, because you have to discover all those really unusual things that happen in everyday driving or every year driving, that yeah. long tail and that's uh, part of what's going on right now is this continued learning. But it's also part of the reason why Waymo has such a head start on everyone, because they, they've been doing this a long time, and they've accumulated a lot of experience. Yeah. I, I was curious, you know, as far as reducing the fatality rate, I checked. It sounds like um, there's a little over one fatality per 100 million miles driven or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So to get a sense on whether really Safer? Does that mean we need to get a few hundred million miles have, driven you, with these you, cars? You have have to, or and I would say and supplement that with AI and machine learning and great simulation hmm. models. So, you know, this isn't about any one sensor. It's not about any one enabling technology. It's this combination of maps, sensors, onboard processors, software, and then in the development process to be able to go out there and capture a lot of data when you encounter something unusual on the road, bring that back to the lab, and simulate it, um, virtually simulate it in reality, and learn mm -hmm. about the edge cases, and get confident that you've dealt not just with the unusual thing that you observe. So take traffic circles, for example. Yeah. Um, we've all, you've all probably been in a traffic circle. Have you been in two-lane traffic circles or three-lane traffic circles, and do you have to capture everything about all of those in the real world, or can you model that and get mm -hmm. to the edge cases and, and move yourself forward? Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. So, so part of it is real world driving. Part of it is taking the data you've collected from Absolutely. those drives and simulating, and that gets us Abs closer Absolutely. to those 100 millions. So, so you, you say, why might, why might Google get into this? Um, because they're not a car company, but extraordinary deep knowledge of, of computer science uh, and, um, and robotics. You know, the best servers in the world, the best mapping system in the world, great AI teams, 
And it's really a shift, fundamental shift, in what are the core competencies required to be a leader in transportation in the future versus the historic ones. And the historic ones, which we cover quite a bit in the book, really like 130 years of history of combustion-based vehicles that are uh, energized by oil, that are human-controlled, with the controls being hydraulic and electronic primarily. And those competencies were about combustion and, and the driver interface to get the ultimate driving machine. And we're going to have in the future the ultimate riding machines, not the ultimate driving machines. So this is a profound shift in the fundamental competencies to be a leader in transportation. Yeah. Yeah, I think you, you, know, you sort of explained that there are three trends that are coming together, right? There's the, the software and the, the driverless technology. Um, and there's electric vehicles which have some advantages, like they're much easier for software to control than mm -hmm. an all-mechanical mm -hmm. one. And then there's this idea of transportation as a service rather than you know, yeah. personal ownership. And, and those are like the three those factors are, that are all coming together. Yeah, yeah, they've all come together. Two of them are really technology-enabled, and the other one is a business model innovation. Mm -hmm. So again, it's not about one thing. It's about several things combining at the same time. I like to call that the power of and. That's the connecting of the dots. And here's kind of how this, this logic goes. When you have an autonomous vehicle, suddenly you don't need to pay a person to drive the vehicle and reposition it. And um, that makes selling transportation as a service a pretty compelling opportunity because you've lowered the cost then of getting high utilization out of a vehicle. So it can pick me up, take me to my destination, drop me off, and then without any labor costs, go a couple blocks and pick you up and take you to your destination and drop you off and keep doing that throughout the day and you get very high utilization of that fleet. Uh, today, most cars are used about 12,000 miles a year. These transportation service business models suggest it'll be 75,000 miles a year. The cars are parked 90 to 95% of the time. What I just described means the vehicle is en route to pick you up rather than being parked. But what you, what you do then is, because it's autonomous and it's a service, you want to optimize the cost per mile. The car industry has been focused on optimizing the price of a new car at a dealership mm -hmm. when you go there and fall in love with it to buy it. When you optimize the cost per mile, it turns out electric drive is a really good deal. Because a fleet optimized cost per mile, you want the vehicle to last about 300,000 miles, and electric drive can save you five to 10 cents a mile. That's $15,000 to $30,000 over the lifetime, which is more than enough to pay for the electric drive. Mm -hmm. So the funny thing about this is it's autonomous vehicles, I think, that's going to get us past the tipping point for electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. Now, to make this story even better, 80% of the trips we make is, as Americans are one- and two-person trips. But our cars and trucks are designed, way over-designed, for the occasional trip. When you tailor design this autonomous electric vehicle for this transportation service and the most typical trips, it probably wants to be a two-person mm -hmm. vehicle. It's probably going to have about one-tenth as many parts in it as a conventional car. And that is really important to understand if you're in the car industry. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's the simplicity of electric drive. You don't have transmissions. You don't have exhaust systems. You have gasoline tanks. You don't have all those mechanical parts in the engine moving. Mm -hmm. And you get rid of all the parts with the driver interface. Right. So boom, it's really transformational. Yeah. One of, the, one of the stories that actually was one of my favorite in the book, uh, I, I think it was when uh, Byron McCormick brought you out to the Vehicle Assessment yes. Center. And he, you know, he sort of showed you, and maybe you want to describe what that was like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, in 1988, I was asked to lead an initiative at GM called Design for Manufacturing. And um, you know, we had a lot of different products, and our cars just seemed like they were harder to put together than our competitors. And so we decided to tear apart our competitors' cars, lay out all the parts, and then conceive of how they're building their cars. And lo and behold, we were way uh, uncompetitive. So this teardown center became an important place for a lot of the leaders of GM to begin to visualize what was going on. Byron McCormick, who um, reported to me, was one of the tech, best technologists I've ever worked with. Uh, he had uh, le, uh, ran the battery plant for GM's EV1. He was one of the pioneers of what's now called stability control. Um, but very importantly, he led our fuel cell program as well. 
And Byron can, and his team conceived of what we call a vehicle platform called E-Flex, which was based on these principles of electric motors in the wheels, energy storage, and the, the platform, almost like a skateboard, and then by-wire steering, by-wire braking, and really optimized around software. And he went ahead and, and prototyped it and laid out all the parts in a torn down way in the same place where he took apart a Chevy Malibu and he took apart a Prius and laid those parts out. Well, the Prius had more parts than a Malibu because it was a hybrid, but the E-Flex had radically fewer. I mean, you could really see where the industry was going to head when it was going to be electrical and electronically controlled. So we brought my boss, Rick Wagner, in, who was the chairman and CEO of GM. He had to see this, and he, he got it. He, he understood it wasn't just all the fewer parts, because the parts that you have to design, engineer, release, manufacture, tool, they drive the cost structure of a car company, but it also was the software. And that was just so important. And it's, I think a lesson out of that is when you have an idea and you're trying to communicate it, getting to rapid prototyping and making it visible for a lot of people, I think really helps get your idea communicated. Yeah, yeah, I love, I love you know, the visual of seeing you know, the, the car exploded and all the parts of the Malibu and then the, the electric vehicle with radically fewer parts. Yeah, That's just yeah. a, uh, a great way to get your point across. Um, the, the, one of the other things I found fascinating was that you know, it sounds like maybe 2010, 2011, I think you were at Columbia, and you were kind of modeling how this would work. And I think you picked Ann Arbor and a few other yeah. cities and found that you, you, know, like you can offer this service with actually not that many cars relative to the number of cars that people actually you know, yeah. park in their driveways in Ar Ann Arbor. Yeah, there was a, a famous economics professor at Columbia named Jeff Sachs, and he had written the book End of Poverty, and he was running an institute called the Earth Institute. And when GM was going bankrupt, he came and visited us, and um, I gave him an overview of some of the, the thinking we had longer term, and Jeff and I hit it off. And when I left GM, he asked me if I would lead Columbia's program for sustainable mobility, which, which I decided to do. And what we were really interested in is, no kidding, what would a city look like if you combined tailor designed vehicles for the two person, one person trip with electric drive that are autonomous and importantly shared? How many would you need to meet all the transportation requirements of a city and how much would it cost? So we decided to model this. And at that time, there was a really neat database. It was a 2009 household travel survey from the federal government. And it gave us a good idea of how many cars were in, in cities like Ann Arbor or Austin or Columbus, Ohio, Rochester, New York, Manhattan, uh, Palm Beach County, Florida. So we um, sat down and started to model this. And um, there were 200,000 cars in Ann Arbor, about 120,000 of them stayed within the metropolitan area. And our modeling came back and said we could get all of the trips that those cars are making done with 18,000 shared vehicles, just 15% of, of the cars that were there. We thought we had to be wrong because at the same time we concluded we could get to the customers quickly within minutes mm -hmm. and that the fleet would be highly utilized. And we kept studying this, convinced we didn't have it right. But finally we understood the population density of places like Ann Arbor was high enough such that the trip frequency throughout the 14 busy hours of the day was high enough such that just after they dropped me off somewhere in Ann Arbor, Sure enough, there was a high probability someone a couple blocks away was requesting a ride. And that's yeah. how the math worked out. And that, that was the, the moment. And then when we said, what would this cost? You know, the electricity cost, the insurance, the cost of the vehicle being depreciated, finance costs, both your time costs and out-of-pocket costs. We thought we could get to something on the order of 20 cents a mile. And that's compared to owning and operating a car at about $1.50, including your time cost. So you, you bounce that against the three trillion miles a year that Americans drive, and that's a four trillion dollar disruption. And that, that was a pretty big aha. Yeah. And we went about getting that story told, and it was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, and, and so how much of that um, for four and a half trillion dollars is spent on fossil fuels? Well, um, uh, uh, it's, we use about 180 billion gallons of gasoline a year. Yeah, so, you know, th yeah. th three bucks, I'd say about uh, 500, 500 billion, yeah. Yeah, so it's, uh, it, so, you know, if this 
yeah. works out, it's going to really significantly change. Well, very the significant, yeah. And an interesting irony, a sad irony about that is the year General Motors went bankrupt, um, embarrassingly, we lost $32 billion. Exxon Mobil made $45 billion. That year, oil prices had gone to $1.60 a barrel. I'm, I'm sorry, $160 a barrel. Hmm. They called 160, and they made 45 billion dollars. That was the highest profit ever made by a company at that point in time. And the sad thing about that oil consumption is, when you refine it to make gasoline, and you burn it in a combustion engine, about 75 percent of that energy, 70, let's say 75 to 80 percent, it gets lost as heat and friction and sound, that kind mm -hmm. of a thing. So about 20 to 30 percent creates torque that turns the wheels of the car. The cars weigh three to 4,000 pounds, and people weigh you know, 120 to 200 pounds. Jeremy, the bottom line is just 1 to 2 percent of the energy in that gallon of gasoline mm -hmm. moves you, the driver. And here's yeah. this company that makes $45 billion. Uh, and the only way ExxonMobil could have done that is because GM was in the business of building and selling cars that relied on oil. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh it's a disruption in, in a lot of ways. Well, it's a, it's a huge disruption. It's a disruption to the people who drive for a living. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, I understand that and I respect that. If my profession was being disrupted by this, I don't think I would feel comfortable about that. But also it's a disruption to the auto industry because far fewer parts mean far fewer employees um, in the supply base and at the original equipment manufacturing base, but also far fewer engineers because you have to design fewer parts. Mm -hmm. It's a disruption to the corner gas station operator because these vehicles will be supplied probably through fleets. And by the way, you can have one for your dedicated use. Please don't think the only solution here is a shared vehicle like an Uber without a driver. Mm -hmm. You certainly can subscribe to one and have it for your own personal dispatch desires, but at the end of the day, you're not going to want to stop to refuel it or recharge it. So this recharging is going to be done at a depot, not at a corner gas station. The beauty of that is it lets us introduce alternatives to oil without having to have 170,000 gas mm -hmm. stations. So you pull that string. Parking gets impacted. Dealers get impacted. Land use and real estate gets impacted. The entire economy gets impacted, quite frankly. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh yeah, it was fascinating to sort of yeah. like enter into that analysis in the book. I was also thinking we're here in New York City, mm -hmm. uh, so I think the recent news uh, is that the city is considering putting a limit on the number of Uber and Lyft drivers. Uh, and sort of, I, like, I wondered what your take on that sort of policy issue in the short term is. You know what? Well, I yeah, I I believe. Um, it's an important issue because you have an awful lot of people out there trying to make money as, a, as an Uber driver. Mm -hmm. And there needs to be this balance between supply and demand. And if you have too many people out there and not enough customers, you're going to have more cars on the road, not really creating value. So that's problematic. Mm -hmm. I do worry about governments thinking they can regulate that rather than the market mm -hmm. finding that right balance. So, so I am yeah. concerned about that. When you do get to driverless cars, um, your whole goal will be to have high fleet utilization because that's key to making money. Right. And you're going to optimize the size of your fleet so that you have high utilization, low empty miles, and fast mm -hmm. response times. And um, so I don't think that carries over to the driverless discussion. Fortunately, the regulators at the local, state, and federal uh, level for driverless cars have understood that the only way we're going to get to this goal of, of fully driverless is to learn on public roads. So mm -hmm. they haven't stepped up and said, you can't do this. And that's, by the way, that's a big difference between General Motors and Google. Um, uh, Sebastian Thrun and Chris Ermson and their team, when they started their project, they wanted to learn on public roads. And so they wondered if they could do it. And the law in California said you needed to have a driver in the driver's seat. It didn't say you needed to touch the steering wheel, the brake pedal, or the accelerator. So they just went off and did it. My general counsel at General Motors would say, no way. You can right. only test in a, in a proving ground. Right. So they had to get on public roads. And this, this is a technology. Think about it. You eliminate 90% of the crashes in the world. There's 1.3 million people a year dying on the world's roadways. That is epidemic in scale. Get rid of 90% of that, that's a million lives a year. 
divide that by 365, that's 3,000 lives a day. If we get to this end goal one day sooner, we're going to save 3,000 lives. So I think the biggest risk is not moving fast enough. And the regulators, fortunately, haven't said stop. They haven't said you can't learn on public roads and, and we're making good progress. We need to be open, share the data, and um, uh, learn together. But I, I think we'll take the journey and we'll get there, Jeremy. Yeah. I really do. Yeah. I, it reminds me of, uh, of another funny story in the book. Um, I think from early on with the, the Carnegie Mellon team that they were posting videos uh, on their blog of testing the vehicle, stopping, and someone somewhere on your team, a middle manager, saw it and thought, oh my god, I can't believe GM is funding this. we got to put an end to it. Yeah, very, very different cultures. We, we had a, a sad stretch in the late 80s and early 90s of too many fatalities in our plants. These were our employees. Maybe they had to do maintenance on a robot and they didn't lock, lock, the, lock out the robot and they got in there and were, got electrocuted or something. So we said enough is enough. So we went and benchmarked the best in the world, Alcoa, DuPont, and we wanted to be the benchmark safest company to work for. So safety was really ingrained into everybody at GM. So when this individual who, who reported to me saw how our Carnegie Mellon team was testing the vehicles, he felt it was way outside the envelope on our safety culture and um, felt we needed to shut down the program. We worked through that. Chris Ermson did a good job with some diplomacy. And, uh, but really, I, I can't overemphasize that safety has to be the overriding priority for, for any organization. And, and I so admire what the Google self-driving car team has accomplished. And they've done it with a tremendous safety culture. They've got this group, we call it the Ops Group. And um, they, every morning they shake down all of the cars, make sure the car is physically ready to go out on the road, mm -hmm. put their cell phones in their locker. They go out and they're highly trained people um, following standardized processes. And they really, really take their job seriously. Whenever you, if you ever have a chance to be in the area where they work, you, you almost feel like it's the same discipline you would see and uh, military operations, it's that serious. And it's, it's paid off for us. Waymo has had one at-fault crash. It was a two-mile-per-hour fender bender. We've had some others, and in all those other cases, it was the other driver, it was the human driver that caused it. Yeah. Um, I've been curious about like, yeah, what, what the limits of um, unexpected things you can plan for are. Um, the, um, thinking to a story from the urban mobility challenge, you know, what happens if your uh, autonomous vehicle pulls up next to the jumbotron and that yeah, uh, yeah. disables the GPS? Yeah, this was one of these these moments. The Carnegie Mellon team um, had some challenges along the way. The first race was in the desert, and part of their development work, they rolled their Hummer, which was their development vehicle, over and. That caused some problems with sensors, and we think that's why it only went seven miles. In the second race, lo and behold, they had the same thing happen. They had two vehicles in that race. The one that really was probably the best vehicle had had a, a fuel, um, or an, actually an electromagnetic interference sensor we found out later on, damaged, and it was causing strange things with the fuel. And um, so the... Uh, I lost my train of thought again, Jeremy. What was the point? Oh, I, was, I was thinking about the, and then in the urban mobility oh, challenge. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and then in, in the actual DARPA urban challenge, um, we, we were the favorite. We thought we were going to win this race. We felt real good about all of our tests. And through the preliminary heats, they sorted down to 14 finalists, and we were in the pole position. And that meant we got to go out on the track first. And, um, we couldn't get the GPS to calibrate. Something just wouldn't lock in, and I mean, everyone's panicking, and they go to get another GPS unit, and it turns out ESPN was covering the event, and they had a huge jumbotron located right next to our vehicle, and the person from the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, who sponsored it, Tony Tether, said, turn off the jumbotron. As soon as they turned it off, our GPS calibrated, and we were back in the race. So yes, there are yeah. those are learning things. You know, yeah. you know, I dedicate this book um, to engineers who make what's possible real. How, how many of you here today are, are engineers or computer science or technical backgrounds? 
I mean, that's really what we do. And, and I'm an engineer from the top of my head to the tip, tips of my toes. And as long as the principles of science are, are followed, I think an engineer can accomplish almost anything if you give them the right learning cycles. But who would have thought we would have had this interference? But now we know. And, and that's what this is all about, learning way out on the tail of the distribution on, on learning cycles. And that was one of those great examples of learning. Yeah, yeah. Uh, great example of, of what's going to go wrong in the real world when we... Yes, yes, things will go wrong in the world, real world. Sadly, they go wrong and kill 40,000 Americans yeah. a year right now. And um, I, I, I have to be really candid with you. Every time I read about someone going the wrong way on the interstate and having a head-on killing four or five people, it just breaks my heart because I know the technology exists to prevent that. And my daughters are 30 and 27, so I took them through driver's training, and it was an absolute nightmare to see an inexperienced driver. I mean, next time you do go th drive through a busy intersection, you're an experienced driver. Think of what you're sorting out, all of the visual clutter that's there, and what you really have to pay attention to to get through that intersection safely. And now you take a 15-year-old kid who's never done it before. It's learning curve, Jeremy. And um, we, we've got to do better than this. We absolutely have to do better than those fatalities. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did like the the way you can contrast the sort of the engineering cultures in Detroit and Silicon Valley through mm -hmm. the book, and they, you know, and they each have their strengths. And I think you, uh, I'm pretty sympathetic to the uh, the Google software engineering culture, but you pointed out how uh, you know maybe some of the Googlers needed to come to terms with yeah. the things Detroit is good at, too, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, the original title of the book was um, The Race to Build the Driverless Car. And um, uh, Echo, who's our publisher, and Denise, is, who's the editor, is here. Denise, you may want to raise your hand. But she said, maybe you ought to write it about the quest. And that was really an important moment for myself and Chris Shulgin because suddenly we realized, you know, maybe this isn't Silicon Valley versus Detroit. Maybe it's a bigger story than that. Early on, when I first arrived as the, the gray-haired executive at, at Google self-driving cars, there was, um, I would say, an arrogance in the team about Silicon Valley being able to handle these great world challenges at light speed, and the auto industry had lost its way on innovation, and really really was no longer imaginative at the same time when uh, Chris Urmson and Anthony Lewandowski first went to Detroit looking for car companies and suppliers to collaborate with. They basically threw them out the door and thought they were irresponsible developing cars on public roads. So there's this tension between the Silicon Valley culture and the Detroit culture. Where the story stands now, where this quest stands now, it's an and, it's not an or. Um, I think by hiring John Kraftchuk to lead Waymo, it was a recognition by Alphabet's leadership that they needed somebody with a lot of car experience to take this forward and commercialize it. And, and John is really, really deep in his car experience. And at, at, at the same time, I think Ford and General Motors realized that they're going to have to reach out to Silicon Valley to outsource their research and development on autonomous vehicle systems. So GM acquired Cruise Automation. And then Argo AI was uh, acquired by Ford. So it's, they've come together. It's the Silicon Valley and Detroit that will lead this forward. Yeah, yeah, quite fascinating. I think uh, another thing that kind of moved the story along was some, you know, some combination of visionaries and, and, um, and setting really audacious goals, right, these challenges, both DARPA's challenges and then, uh, uh, you know, I guess Larry and Sergey setting challenges with, Sebastian Thrun and others, you know, like what, what can you make happen yeah. here? Yeah, it's a great management principle, yeah. setting stretch goals. And when you're the person who has to reach the stretch, stretch goal, sometimes it can be a little bit frightening. But think about it this way. You, you could say you're, um, you, you want to accomplish something on a scale of 10, and um, you can set your, your goal at, at, at 6 and get to 7 and feel good about it. Or you could have set your goal at nine and get to eight and not get there. You'd rather be at eight than seven. So stretch goal is an important principle. The Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, set stretch goals for the Desert Challenge, which, of which were two, and then the goal for the 
urban challenge with 60 miles in a city setting with no one in the car, no remote control, obey all traffic laws, and get it done in six hours. And nobody thought it could be done. So the DARPA challenge ends. Everybody's feeling great about it. Tony Tether, the head of DARPA, says, mission accomplished. You guys have proven this can be done. It's up to the commercial sector to run with it. And we all thought people would be falling all over themselves wanting to take the next step to make it commercial. And nothing happened. Caterpillar reached out and started doing some work for mining applications. But we wanted to change the whole world of automobiles. Larry and Sergey were the only two leaders that stepped up. Larry and Sergey, they were at that race. Uh, they had a passion for this subject. And Larry had a great conversation with Sebastian Thrun and, and said, Sebastian told Larry, we can't do this. We shouldn't do it. Sebastian told Larry, I'm the best in this field. I know what I'm talking about. We shouldn't get into it. And Larry said, I have to tell Eric and Sergey a real reason why we can't do it. So he sends Sebastian back the third time. And finally, Sebastian came back and said, well, maybe we can. And then they set these stretch goals. Think about this as a form of leadership. Larry wanted it to go on every road in California. So they negotiated that they would pick 10 100-mile routes. And you know who laid out the routes? Larry and Sergey. <laughs> and they put a bonus in place for the team to get this done in two years. So Sebastian negotiates another goal, 100,000 miles on public roads, because they want to at least get a little bit of payment. This is really impressive leadership. And then they stuck with the team, and, and the team got it done. So th there's a management lesson here. You have to set it far enough out where it's really hard to get there, but not so far out that it's impossible. And they've subsequently put additional goals on the Waymo team that they're working really, really hard on right now in Chandler, Arizona, tied to do people like riding in these cars? Can you do it safely? Is there a business here? All of that stuff. But it's really a good lesson in, in management. Yeah, and I guess uh, um, Tony at DARPA had the the sort of the most challenging one. He really had to stick to his guns, right? Because after the first urban challenge, or the first desert challenge was supposed to be 150 miles, and the, the best car did, what, seven Came miles? Seven miles, and he had all this media stacked up at the finish line, and nobody got there. So Tony <laughs> goes to the finish line, and he says, I got great news. The next race and he's, is in, at, on this date, and the prize is $2 million. <laughs> so he really pivoted That's well. got guts, right? And, yeah. uh, this is a lot of money for these young teams competing for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought that was a, a great story. Like, you know, stick with this approach. Um, I was, I was also curious as we, you know, like the, the engineering cultures are coming to appreciate the, you know, like what they have to offer each other. But you also, I think, kind of made a point at least in Detroit, right? The, there's actually a hierarchy of engineering teams, right? So the parts manufacturers mm -hmm. and some of the parts manufacturers are as big as the the auto companies that yes, sell sir. the brand name. And so I sort of wonder, what kind of hierarchy are we going to see in the future? I, you know, is, um, is Uber the brand we're going to know, or, you know, or Lyft, or Waymo? Is it going to be Toyota? Uh, you know, is there going to be a lot of competition about that? Uh, yes, there's going to be competition. First of all, there's a lot of different use cases for these brands. There's the use case of Ubers and Lyfts without drivers. There's the use case of you basically leasing an autonomous vehicle and having a subscription service so that you're controlling it. So think about that. You, you say, I want one of these for 12 months, and I'm going to subscribe for 30,000 miles. It takes you to work, drops you off. You then dispatch it to go pick up your spouse, take him or her to work, drops them off. And your spouse dispatches it to go pick up your kid at school for soccer practice, and then mother-in-law for Meals on Wheels. So you may use this one dedicated vehicle to the point where you don't need that second and third car, but you're still going to have that control that you have. Mm -hmm. So you've got that use case. Don't forget goods movement. Over the road trucking, um, there's a shortage of truck drivers. A truck driver is 64 cents a mile in benefits and wages. And um, it's a tedious job. It takes people away from their homes. So there's real value to be created there. And then finally, that last mile of delivery. My goodness, I work out of my home office. I've had two times were the UPS truck and FedEx truck were in my driveway at the same time. I came home from golfing two weeks ago. I had nine boxes on my porch. My wife has been busy. She's a hairstylist. She likes to get all this 
stuff over the internet, but that last mile, if you can get the driver out of the local delivery system, whether it's with drones or you name it, so a wide range of use cases. How are you gonna brand that is important. What are the experiences you're gonna deliver? It's not just about going from point A to point B and getting there safely. It's, does it pick me up at my precise location, drop me off precisely? Is the ride so nice that when I get out of the vehicle, I feel better than when I got into it? Can I get to more places with brand A versus brand B? Mm. That's going to be a basis of competition. But the one place I think you want to be beyond anything else in this future ecosystem is to have the world's best driver. Because that world's best driver can play in every one of those use cases. Mm. And it's typically more than half the cost per mile that we incur today. So that's a big opportunity. Now, does this play out in a Microsoft kind of a business model or an Intel inside business model or an ARM business model? Those decisions haven't been made yet. There's still mm -hmm. a lot of work to do before you start scaling. Um, I think the experiences will get branded. I personally think the car companies are going to have a tough time saying Chevrolet is the right brand for a mobility service. I think that's going to be a bit of a stretch. Mm -hmm. So I think you're going to see some rebranding going on. It's going to be fun. Yeah. All right. It's, uh, it's been great talking to you. I think I have to let everyone else ask some questions. Well, thank you. Too. Thank you. Thank you for reading the book. Your questions were excellent. And um, certainly when you're an author, you, you, you love it when someone will give you some of your time over the weekend. It's really yeah. nice, Jeremy, that yeah. you did that. Yeah, that was, it was uh, great fun to read. Great story. Yeah, just one thing for the Q&A. Um, I lost my hearing 20 years ago. I hear with cochlear implants. And it's the same technology as autonomous cars. It's batteries and sensors and software and uh, all of that stuff. I think I'll hear you fine. But if not, Jeremy will help me with the questions. Go ahead. Hey, Larry. Thanks for coming to talk to us. Um, I have a three-year-old at home. And uh, you know, I think about in 13 years, he's going to get his driver's license. What are the odds that he's going to get his driver's license? <laughs> you know, I think the odds are, are, are pretty low. There's a lot of people who are enthusiastic about driving. And, you know, 100 years ago, there were a lot of people enthusiastic about horses. And, um, you know, they, <laughs> they're still horse racing. They're still equestrian. The important message right now is not that we're going to say you can't drive, but for a lot of people, we're going to say you're going to get the accessibility mobility benefits of owning and operating a car and not have to drive. So your, your, your child is going to be able to make a choice uh, by the time they're 15 or 16. There's a lot of negatives with owning and operating a car beyond the safety risk, having to stop to buy gas, having to find parking, having to get your car maintained, having to shop for it, uh, having to insure it and finance it. And you put all that together and you say, man, that's a real hassle. And this industry has existed for a century, assuming you're willing to do that and pay 35000 bucks for a car. So I think that world's going to change quite a bit. Thank you. Thank you. Over here. So I actually have two questions. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is a big downside of electric vehicles has always been distance per charge. Uh, what about taking a trip in the world that you're describing here? Uh, how would I go from New York City to Buffalo to get some buffalo wings for the weekend? How does that play into what you're talking about, which is more uh, you know, daily travel, commuting, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's an exciting question. The range of the batteries has, has increased significantly. The Chevrolet Bolt, for example, has about a 230-mile range. So we think the battery is sufficient for the everyday community kind of usage in this shared model. Going between communities, um, you may have like a, a, a range extender that you could uh, associate with this, um, almost like a, a pod that snaps on the back that's extra battery just when you need to make that trip that can extend your range and extend your power to do that. Uh, I wouldn't totally rule out hydrogen and fuel cells. I, I wish I never uttered the word fuel cell because this is just a hydrogen battery. It's another kind of a battery. But that's its real advantage is you can fill up with hydrogen and have significant range. I do think when the, when the market's there, um, we're going to have the solutions in place to get you from uh, Buffalo to New York City if that's where you want to go. One, one way ticket to Buffalo, though. <laughs> Uh, that's right, we can plug it in when we get there. Um, so we saw in the late 90s, early 2000s with the EV1, for example, as you mentioned, the effect of the oil and gas lobbies um, and, what, and their effect on the saturation of the electric vehicle as a whole in the United States. Has that changed it at all? Are we at the point where we're ready to see uh, gas and oil 
cars off the road, or is, are we still fighting that same battle? I certainly can see a, a pathway to not need oil any longer in the transportation sector. I hesitate a bit. Um, diesel is a really good way to move 80,000 pound loads, so there may be some applications there, but I think for about 80% of the oil, we, we can get off of that. Will we? Um, the thing that keeps me up at night, quite honestly, I think what's going to gate all of this are those very powerful voices that have a vested interest in the 130-year-old automobile roadway transportation system. The easiest thing to do in Washington, D.C. is say no. And these companies who have something to lose from this are very good at knowing how to say no. So that does concern me. But technologically, I think we're there. I think in terms of value proposition for all of us living our everyday lives, I think we're there. Business model, uh, investors wanting to put the money in this new future rather than where we've been, I think we're there. Now it's just a matter of almost like the baseball movie, Field of Dreams, if I build it, they will come. And that's why I'm so proud to be part of Waymo uh, as an advisor, because that's what they're doing in Chandler, is they're pr proving this thing out. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Uh, you mentioned that you view uh, sort of this market as being very competitive. And I was just wondering how you think about like network effects of like Uber and Lyft, basically their entire business model yeah. is just if you have all the drivers, then you have all the passengers, and you can you know be a monopoly. Yeah. Uh, like, I, I guess, how do you think about what uh, the market will look like, whether you view uh, transportation as centralizing and what like regulatory or other options. Uh, you Very important questions. And one of the interesting part uh, results from the work I did at Columbia, not only did we get this 20 cent per mile opportunity identified, it turns out scale economies are reached at about 10% of the miles driven in a community. What I mean by that is if I had a shared fleet that I was running in Ann Arbor and I had 10% market share, and I went to 11%, my cost per mile wasn't going down anymore. That suggests that um, you don't need to have the entire market in order to, to have scale and be, and be competitive. With that said, there's definitely network effects here. There's definitely scaling effects. There's learning effects. I talk about having the world's best driver. One of the best ways to do that is to be learning for more and more and more vehicles on the road every day. And when the beauty of a driverless car is when I learn something from one car, I can put it in all the other cars and make all of them safer. When I learn something as a human driver about how to do something better, I have no mechanism for transferring that to other human drivers. So these things are real important. I think they're going to have to be watched. Certainly not a reason not to go forward, but they're going to have to be managed for sure. Over here? Yes. Yeah. Hi. I'm very excited about uh, driverless cars, and uh, certainly there's tremendous uh, uh, future. There's one thing that worries me about that's impact on freedom, because uh, a car was the greatest vehicle for freedom and opportunity. Uh, ability to go someplace uh, is a great boon for humans. But now the way the driverless cars are being actually designed and implemented means we depend on cloud services and on provider of cloud services desire to enable my trip. Uh, Google decides not to map certain area. The cars will not go to that area. Uh, Google, or better yet, the government decides that certain event is not good they can easily make cars not go to that event. Yeah. And uh, this is because we have no other way of doing things other than through the cloud service. We, don't, we, will, uh, we will not really own anything, even if we buy the, uh, the car. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I mean, first of all, the title of my book is Autonomy because I believe this future is going to bring more freedom um, there's a lot of people today that can't benefit from an, 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 owning and operating an automobile. They're too young to drive it, they're too old, or they're not capable physically to do it. They can't afford it, or whatever it might be. So we really think we're going to bring more freedom to a lot more people with this. If, if the concern that you raise, which is really kind of beyond my area of expertise, I, if you're concerned about that, I encourage you to go out and start working on it because we want this to be an enabler of much greater freedom rather than a, con a constrainer of freedom. I think when you look at the 100-year history of the auto industry, a lot of that stuff was playing out as well. Where were you going to build the road? And where were you going to build the parking lot? And 
um, who pays for the roads and all of that. And I think we have created an extensive amount of uneven access and inequality in our mobility systems. I, I live north of Detroit, and our neighborhoods in Detroit still have a lot of poverty. And these people can't break out of the cycle of poverty because we don't have any transportation alternatives other than a car, and the car insurance is off the chart. It's expensive. So all of this has to be managed and talked about, and I'd encourage that dialogue to continue. I think great observation. Yes? Hey, I was wondering if you thought that the influx of autonomous vehicles in cities uh, will result in cities becoming more multimodal, more walkable, more bikeable, more mass yes. transit with first last mile, or if you thought it would just increase car dependence, increase the widening of roads, et cetera? I think it's going to be the, the former. I mean, there's three parking spaces dedicated to every car in the United States, and there's you know 250 million cars, so that's a lot of parking. And that parking um, constrains densification. Um, I, I do want to make a, a point, though. Only 26% of Americans live in cities. 53% of Americans live in suburbs. And that parking issue is even more severe there. Um, I'm on the board of a real estate development company in Florida, and we had a parcel of land that we were developing along I-75 uh, south of Tampa, St. Petersburg. And they ended up putting a... Um, um, Walmart on that site, but the amount of land for parking was twice the amount of land for the building. And this is nuts. And so I, I think this is an opportunity to really drive densification. And secondly, the vehicles are dramatically better at detecting pedestrians, detecting bicyclists, and uh, taking a lot of the risk out of the system for vulnerable roadway users. I sometimes talk about this, con you've heard the concept of secondhand smoke. I like to talk about secondhand physics. For some reason, there's a belief that somebody can drive a 5,000 pound Cadillac es Escalade on one of the streets in Manhattan and go 45 miles an hour. And it's, that's secondhand physics. I mean, <laughs> it's just kinetic energy. So we've got to work through it. But I, I'm in the camp where I think we're going to make cities more livable. But very importantly, I think we're going to improve suburbs a lot too. So the whole driverless car thing seems reminds me a lot of the internet in the 1980s, 1990s. Yes, it does. A lot of innovation and exciting things. One of the things that happened sort of after that time in the internet is we discovered there's a lot of malefactors out yes. there. Yes. And um, one of the things that I haven't heard anyone in this industry really talking about too much is how do you defend uh, and make secure your driverless car, not only against the kind of attacks that are already taking place against you know, automated but driver full cars, but against jamming or other kinds of attacks on the sensors and things like that, which you know, nobody's doing that now. It's wonderful. Everybody's cooperating mostly, but you know, that doesn't last forever. Yeah, yeah. I, um, the whole cybersecurity area, again, is, is not my expertise. I talk to people who understand it better than I do. And we've got a lot of people working on that hard. It's not an issue that's unique to driverless cars. It also exists in human-driven cars. Our, our current cars are very vulnerable to being hacked. It's, it's part of other systems we use in our daily lives, the airline system and other things. And so I share the concern. Um, but, but not to the, and I'm not implying you're suggesting this, but not to the point where it says we shouldn't be pushing this opportunity to its full extent. I believe the way to go at this is to think big. And certainly Google self-driving cars and Google and Alphabet are thinking very big in this space. Start small, 13 Priuses, get out and start learning on public roads. Learn fast. We've been learning fast now for almost a decade, and it's been extraordinary insights. And then scale smart. I don't think anyone's going to want to scale a system that has the vulnerabilities that that you're concerned with. We're going to have to have solutions to that. Should that be the first problem to fix? I don't know. You know, I, I don't think solving snowstorms on Loveland Pass at nighttime was the first thing to work on in driverless cars. We may never solve that one, but I think we got to get out there and learn. So, what, one more question. One more question. Okay. One more, please. Okay. Uh, okay. So, just where does it start? Uh, in a big way, I mean. Uh, you know, of course, it makes sense to focus on the, the desired end state of, of changing the car experience for Americans. But uh, 
does it actually start in some more limited domain? I don't know, long haul trucking or yes, uh, enthusiasts, uh, early adopters, yes, or um, city centers where there's restricted access for other kind of vehicles, yes. or what? Yeah, I, th I think those use cases are very exciting places to start. Uh, gated communities, campuses, low speed applications. The interesting thing about over the road trucking is not all freeway links are created the same. Some are flat, um, cr straight, nice weather, low traffic density, much easier to get started with this business than some of the curvier, uh, higher traffic areas. So it's not going to be just we suddenly take it and deploy it on a large scale in a major metropolitan area. I think you're going to see a whole bunch of these smaller plays done uh, as we work hard. Again, no one's saying we're ready to commercialize this at scale. Um, what we are saying is we believe the technology is reaching a point where there's commercial va consumer value to be had. And I think with any startup, you want to get to that point. You want to get real customers. You want to get real money coming in. That, that's what we're in the business to do. Yeah. But I think these opportunities you talk about are, are there. All right. Great. Okay. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. I really appreciate it.